you know, um, I mean, it, I just can't get it. But I tell you, this was the book that I was talking about that I, when I was walking down the street, this monk comes up and he hands me this book. Um, we became fast friends after, but I, I didn't know him. I'd never met him. And he just put this book in my, into my hands. And it was exactly what I was looking for. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sabati in Jeddah's Grove, and Anakumbika's Park. And there, Venerable Sariputta addressed the bhikkhus thus, Friends, bhikkhus, friends, they replied. And the Venerable Sariputta said this, Friends, there are four, these four kinds of persons found existing in the world. What four? Here, some person with a blemish does not understand it as it actually is. I have a blemish in myself. Here, some person with a blemish understands it as it actually is. I have a blemish in myself. Here, some person with no blemish does not understand it as it actually is. Thus, I have no blemish in myself. Here, some person with no blemish understands it as it actually is. Thus, I have no blemish in myself. Here, in the person with a blemish who do, does not understand it as it actually is, I have a blemish, is called the inferior of these two persons with a blemish. Here, in the person with a blemish who understands it as it actually is, thus, I have a blemish in myself, is called the superior of these two persons with a blemish. Here, in the person with no blemish who does not understand it as it actually is, I have no blemish is called an inferior of these two persons with no blemish. And here in the person with no blemish who understands it as it actually is, thus I have no blemish, is called the superior of these two persons with no blemish. And so the reason why we're talking about some things and really trying to like hit the mark is the one should recognize when they have a blemish. I mean, if you don't know something's broken, you know, then you won't be trying. You won't be trying to fix it. But to know it's broken is so important. And and so he says that one person can have a blemish and not know it, and one person can have a blemish and know it. And if you have it and you know it, you're considered a superior person simply because you look thoroughly, you can um, recognize, and you can acknowledge that. Um, I have missed the mark, or maybe there's a better way to do this, or am I really sincere? Like a lot of people, um, a lot of people will come to help to help you because uh, they like being needed in that way, <laughs> you know. And so, so out of their neediness, they help, and you can kind of tell which ones those persons are because after they help you. Then they start feeling like they did something for you, you know. Uh, and then you begin to recognize, well, you know, this is really done partly or maybe fully out of their need to be important, their need, their need to help. And so uh, when you have a job like my job and his job, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, the loving thing to do is to point that out for a person. Now, have you considered that? Can you look at it this way? Uh, because every virtue and every non-virtuous quality has its own characteristic, has its um, uh, its way of showing itself. It has its its own um, means of expression, has its own manifestation. So whenever we're doing something that we think is good and useful and beneficial, or um, we should always still examine. You know, like, why am I doing this? You know, how am I doing this? What is my motivation for doing this? Uh, and in that way, we'll come, we'll come to know, to really know ourselves. Um, and that's what's important here. Yeah, I, the reason I tell a lot of stories is because, you know, somebody will ask me a question, I'll give them my answer, but that's my answer. You know, it's not, it still doesn't give you your Answer. I mean, the one that, that you deduced, what you came up with, and I'm happy to give, you know, my, my, my view or my perspective, but what we have to remember is that that's somebody else's answer. 
Um, we have to find our own answers. We have to seek out our own truth. We have to come to understand a particular meaning in a particular situation that has been um, uh, impacted by a particular karma with all of these things. So for 10 different people doing the exact same thing and having the exact same question will be 10 different answers. And so just take answers in kind of a general unless, um, unless you have confidence that the person is giving is speaking directly to you. So sometimes I'm speaking directly. And to maybe not point out somebody, you know, but, but there's the merging of the mind stream and the person needs to hear this, but we don't want to point the person out. You know, so I'll tell a story. It's like this. Um, but so that that mind stream can hear that, and and they can self and they can self correct. So if I understand it, like in order to, to point out something in somebody else, by instead of doing it directly, because that's not so effective, you do it through a story. Well, mm -hmm. oh, sometimes I do it directly too. Who says sometimes he, <laughs> sometimes he uh, corrects gently, and sometimes he corrects harshly, and sometimes he corrects both gently and harshly. You know, the thing is that uh, I mean. Really, it's hard to answer a question that hasn't been asked, number one. So I think you, you know, button up against the wrong tree when, you, when you're trying to point out things. But if one has confidence in someone, one has taken one as their teacher, then one allows or gives that teacher permission, you know, to do some pointing out. That's why I know, who, who, I know who's my student or who's not, you know. So sometimes somebody will come to ask me a question, even in my own song that I told them, they're not my student. And you know, and then their feelings are hurt, and I just feel it shouldn't be hurt, because you know in your heart of hearts, I'm not your teacher. You know, uh, so, you know, I mean, just helping people to be um, clear, to be honest, there's no point in asking me a question if you don't have confidence in what my answer's gonna be. You know, and I have some in, in my song that's like that my feelings on her. You know, I just recognize that they're not going to be able to benefit as much if I have the talk with them, or if I give them an instruction, because there's uh, not the affinity with the giver of the instruction. That's what I'm trying to say. So sometimes you're wanting to offer advice, and, um, uh, and the person would do well to heed that advice. But you're not the one who can give it to them, you know. Uh, and so we have to, uh, or you're not, I've had so many people talk to me about what I need to do, you know, to cure my diabetes. And I just sing that song. If I die, you know, ain't nobody's fault but mine, because I know that. I like my sweet things. I, I <laughs> and, and, and I do what I do, what I do. But I do it with full knowledge and full responsibility. It's my life I'm taking, uh, you know, I, I, it's my life. So you don't have to, you don't have to worry about it. But when I decided that I wanted to do something about it, which I did just a few months ago, everything has changed. You know, when I decide, so I'm like, 90, believe it or not, 90% better around some of the things that I, I should do and should not do around my diabetes. So I go to the doctor. You know, I don't go when I'm doing really bad. I go when I think I'm doing better. And so I go <laughs> and see him. And he was so happy with me. You know, and he was like, I think uh, your, your pancreas has kicked back in and started working again. You know, I think I can take you off of insulin uh, in and come back and see me one more month. You know, and I'm going to put you on this. And if this works, it should bring your levels down and you can come off instantly. I said, yeah, but you see, when you were trying to tell me I'd be on it for the rest of my life, and I was telling you, no, I wouldn't, uh, you know, and, and, but he was so happy. But see, I'm taking personal responsibility for this right now. But I did it in my time. I could have missed my time and died. Yes, I realized that. But that's, that's, that's my choice, you see. So you shouldn't ever try to force anybody to do anything. Sometimes it's just not the right time for them, where they're going to put forth the effort that they need to accomplish. You know, and and in those times, it's just wonderful to be compassionate and to be there for them, waiting for the time. But my doctor waited for my time. You know, he didn't push me too hard. He just waited for 
amount of time. And so, uh, so that's what I wanted to say about, about questions. The other thing is I, t I tell stories to try to encourage you to look at your own life because you, your own life will teach you a lot of things. I mean, you've been having these experiences and they like just like wrong bus, wrong bus, and just letting, letting the bus go on by. But if you go back in light of the dawn and, and begin to, uh, to look at the experiences that you have had in your life and even some that you're having right now, you'll see you'll see the instructions right in the experiences. You'll also see the way of escape. You know, with every temptation, there's a way of escape. You'll see it uh, in your life as your life is unfolding, as you're living in, in, in just one uh, constant now. And uh, so I encourage you to, to look and see what life, your life, is teaching you, is telling you. The second of these... Uh, Transcendences, giving, morality, patience, effort, uh, meditative uh, absorption, and wisdom is morality. And uh, what is morality? It's the avoidance of improper behavior for the sake of others. You know, there's some things I believe is perfectly all right to do. I just tell you. But I don't do it simply because those that I'm around, you know, would be so offended by it because they think it is not a right thing to do. I know I'm perfectly lawful in, in doing that thing or executing that thing, but for their sake, I don't have to do it. And so that's having a moral con conscience. It's not just kowtowing and, and, and giving up and just going with um, what everybody says and pretending that you're for it. I can tell you right now, I'm, I'm not in agreement with that. Nevertheless, let us do this, you know. And, and as you are doing that, you begin to become way more flexible uh, and you grow so much even in your own view. Maybe after a while of that flexibility, your own idea about what is the, the right action will shift, you know. And maybe what you thought was perfectly, what did I say, perfectly lawful, for me, but everything's not expedient, mm -hmm. you see. So something can be lawful, but is it expedient? Is it helpful in this situation? Is it useful? And then sometimes uh, you just abandon an idea. You know, sometimes your idea changes, and what's okay for right now might not be okay at another time, in close proximity time. What's okay right now might not be okay as you grow and develop. What is lawful for you to do as a baby, which is pee your pants, might not be lawful <laughs> for you to do when you're 25. But then when you turn, well, I used to say 70, but since I'm approaching 70, when you turn 95, you know, then, <laughs> then, uh, then you know, maybe that's an allowable <laughs> at that time. You understand what I mean? All the things shift. Everything is relational. Everything is uh, inter. There's this interdependence in this life. So you can't like just walk around with a mirror in front of yourself and say it's me and nobody else. You have to be cognizant of, of the interrelations and the interdependence of all, of all life. So um, I read an article that um, didn't upset me, and I wondered why I was not upset. <laughs> I wondered why I was not upset, because it was about um, a father who, um, um, and he was an immigrant, and I forget what country he was from, but he had moved to America, and his 13-year-old uh, was sitting on his lap, and somebody saw that. And they got really upset and they called the authorities and he was accused of, of child abuse and sexual um, provocation and let's say. And the, the guy was crying and his whole family was crying. I think they were you know, Spaniards or something. He said, We don't understand what the we don't understand what this is like, you know, we descended from well not all of us, but some of us we descended from the Puritans and you know, after you're four, your daughter doesn't sit on your lap or something like that. 
This is in my country, we all do, you know. And he said, yeah, but we're not in your country right now. Uh, and so, and but as I read his story and everything he went through, and, and, and it all got worked out in the end, but it was so hard for him because he had came, he was part of a different culture part of a different way of viewing and understanding things, part of a close-knit kinds of families, and and where coming from where I'm coming from, I still might think that that's inappropriate, you know, but I was judging him from my side, from my view, and from what our society has uh, decided is appropriate and inappropriate behavior. You see, and that's a big difference. Now I can tell you the truth. While we got that issue going on, I come from a place, or I live in a place right now, where uh, it was just four years ago that they passed the law uh, in my part of Western North Carolina that made um, molestation of your own um, child a, uh, a felony. Before that was a misdemeanor. So it's like, you know, if you if you molest somebody else's child, it was a felony. But if you did your own, it was a misdemeanor. So, like, we just, our stuff is homegrown. You know, we just, you know, it, you know, it's, so when I got there, <laughs> the thing is, the thing is that at that time, I, the senator, the senator, that's how I found out about it, the senator, was making a, a big hullabaloo of, about this issue, and he was saying, "Well, I don't know what's going on. You know, why this is such a big, why this is such a big deal and such a big issue." And I moved into a place where, you know, I, I had 85 kids to live with me over a few years. Now, those 85 kids, nine out of ten had been molested by, you know, by their parents, by the mother and father, because it. it it was seen as all right there, you know. It was seen as part of their history, you know. That that in in the mountains you couldn't get across the mountain to meet somebody. I mean, you just whoever was on your side of the mountain, and it was very difficult for me. You know, I wanted I wanted heads to roll. I wanted people to go to jail. I went to the schools and and I asked. I went to the churches and I asked the pastors. You know, they said we don't talk about that. You know. Uh, and they, the children had no advocate. So I became an advocate for them. Of course, everybody hated me, but, you know, they would hate me anyway. I mean, they were hating me anyway. They came and they knocked on my door and they said, we just want to know what you're doing here. You know, I said, hey, let me, let me just tell you. Number one, we don't like uh, northerners, Yankees. I said, number two, our women are seen and not heard. I said, number three... Nobody black leads anything in our town. And number four, you're Buddhist and we don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, that was my welcome. <laughs> that was my welcome to the town. So I, you know, I'm going to have a little powwow with all the Buddhists and the Bodhisattvas and the Tinderettes. Like, y'all sure y'all meant for me to come right here? <laughs> I'm just doing a check-in with you now. There's some new information. <laughs> so sometimes it's good not to know everything, you know, because you might not do what you would do, you know. But now that I'm there, you know, and right away I just started slamming, you know. But it was the wrong approach. It was the wrong idea. Now I've been there for 12 years, and... And I've come to know something about people. I've come to know something about generational ignorance. I've come to know something about, you know, and so now I can approach them in an entirely different way. Not as an antagonist, not hating them, but understanding the gross ignorance and, and how it has affected them in their lives. And, you know, they take them from a, an abusive father and give them to the grandfather who abused the father. Like, does this make any sense? You know, and so, but... Learning to be with them, I've come away with a different understanding of human nature and the faults. And instead of blaming and condemning the person, the one of an understanding temperament condemns the mental formation. One of a hating temperament condemns living beings. So that's how we start to understand how our um, the the setup and how our mind 
works and functions and sees and approaches situations so that when we want to be involved and we want to help and we want our compassion to have its effectual work in the world, there is something that is needful. We have to move from being uh, hating the, the people to like condemning the mind that produces that, but that mind is resident in someone. Uh, and so when you go to these places and you're wanting to help, first you have to deal with your, your anger, you have to deal with your outrage, you have to deal with your rage. Uh, rage is not a reason to do something. Rage is an obstacle. So don't be getting your rage on. Don't be getting your rage on. When you recognize rage is arising, then you need to know there's something you have to do. It's like a, like a fire, you know. And a fire just consumes everything. No matter whether it's your fire or my fire. Fire is fire. It burns up everything. And so we can't be effective when the fire is raging. But when we cooled ourselves so that, that um, we are, are still and we're settled, then our view becomes expansive and we can see the causes that have produced certain conditions. And it puts us in a position to be able to work with and to, and to help people. Um, the Buddha talked about some things specifically regarding uh, morality. And he was saying that, you, he said you can believe it or not believe it, I'm just telling you what I know. You know, I'm, I'm not requiring that you believe it. He says, but, but um, killing people results in a short life. Stealing the loss of wealth. Sexual uh, misconduct, you have a lot of enemies. Lying produces slander. Envy uh, your own hopes will go unrealized. And you'll have misery in this life, and you'll have regret as you come to the end of your life. And so if we look at morality and we think like, I'm such a good person. You know, our morality, that kind of morality that's focused on who I am and what I am and you know, how good I am is not a morality at all because it is avoidance of improper behavior for the sake of others. So something can be proper, but not expedient even. That makes it then improper in that moment, or the handling of it improper. Is that clear? Okay. So, um, it's okay if I talk to you like this? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Um. So he gives us some antidotes for different kinds of, of moral issues. He says for improper conduct, says suppress it. You know, I I remember when um, once some president, um, his wife, Lady Bird, Tweety Bird, Lady. Lady Bird, <laughs> Lady Bird, and uh, she, I don't think it was her, but the one who just said, just say no, and I'm like, I'm like, okay, right, you can't just say no, you know, but then, I look, that's it, entirely, just say no, <laughs> yeah. and so from her perspective, you know, we were all offended, you know, when she came out with this just say no thing. I was living in the ghetto then, you know, and I was like, it's not as easy as just saying no. <laughs> but now if somebody asked me, I'd say, just say no. <laughs> you know? And so if, if what's your opinion or your view at one time? It's not going to be it for all time, you know. If we had, had done more of just saying no, then some of the conditions that exist today really would not exist, you know. But we didn't say no. We didn't. Uh, no, we were so busy trying to help our children in our generation have a better life, giving them all kinds of indulgences. No, I mean, Spock said no shouldn't be in our vocabulary. Uh, and so we like sort of took it out. 
No, not my generation. We still, sorry. Don't send me letters. We still beat our kids. We used to spank our kids. And I was saying, better me than you get out on the street and tell somebody that. And they will because they're not going to, they don't love me. You know, but times change. But then we got to place it, it just became like, what is correcting a child? Oh, these are little grown-ups. No, they're not. They don't have the maturity of mind. They don't have, you know, they're just not. Just look at them. They're not. Four years old. <laughs> Four years old, no means no. That's it. You know, and so, but by the allowances, the indulgences, and they can't, couldn't handle no. They couldn't handle not having anything that they wanted. They couldn't. The way I see some young people talk to their parents, <laughs> we wouldn't be having this conversation because I'd be dead. You know, they, it would never have happened. And so we actually set them up in our permissiveness, you know, um, for a lot of the problems that they have. So I like that adage now when I'm talking with the kids that I work with. I know, I'm just say no. Uh, and and it is getting it is getting through because yes, of the I understand, sweetie. It's so hard. You know, it's not as hard as it's going to get if you don't just say no. And so, talks that he tells us that improper conduct. The thing is to uh, suppress it. When you feel it arising, and one way we can can uh, keep unwholesome, unarisen states from arising is by uh, constantly engaging our mind in wholesome words and thoughts and actions. So some people would have a problem with me in my little songs, you know. But when my mind wants to run towards something, sometimes a little song comes back to me. And it reminds me, and it puts, it, hmm, 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 puts me in a remembrance of the truth. Not song for song's sake, but we're kind of wired in that way. And it puts me in remembrance of the truth. And that, that little phrase, that little catchphrase will just get in my head and roll around and roll around. And it becomes my savior. You know, it plants my mind in a different place. It 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 puts me in a in a in a it says that wherever the mind is, that is the realm that you are abiding in at that time, whether it's in a hell realm or whether it's in the heavenly abode where the mind dwells. And so uh, constantly uh, encouraging yourself, you know, and uh, memorizing the Dharma and repeating it to yourself and reflecting on it here and there, you know, instead of all the time. And I know how addictive this can be. That's, that's me typing on a cell phone. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I never wanted one. You know, I looked at it and it was just horrible. You walk down the street, people. Uh, some, you're sitting at the uh, lunch table, people. <laughs> you know, getting on the elevator, people. <laughs> you know, just everywhere. I thought it was so rude. So, you know, but now I have a cell phone. <laughs> and, um, and I work really hard at not carrying it around with me all the time. And it's just, like, where were you? I've been texting you. I've been, you think I'm supposed to carry a phone around with my head because you might want to talk to me? <laughs> Leave a message. And, and I'll call him back at some point. And I'll call him back this week, next week. <laughs> you know, I, I'm working at, at getting back in a more timely fashion. But, um, for, for, you know, but when did I get on somebody else's clock? I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to know. You know, so why do we feel this? You have to recognize, you know, I, I think it's immoral. This addictive behavior, you know, uh, because it, it, it causes us to not be present, to not be 
mindful. It causes us not to be uh, peaceful and at ease. We have anxiety if we leave our phone. We, I got to go back home. I left my phone. You know, uh, uh, I got to. If it's ringing, I got to see who that is. You know, <laughs> and and you can just feel the uh, the there's a whole pathos around this thing. You know, and something as simple as that. You know, like I I applaud you for your intentions around the phone. Good luck. Let me know how that works out for you because people do not want to part with it. You know, that'll then produce lying. No, I didn't bring a phone with me to the retreat. That'll produce, you know, all of these things because we love it so much. That craving and that clinging to things like that until it becomes a, a part of us and we can't even see ourselves separate. That's what addiction is all about. It's not like I have an addiction to something. It's like that's a part of me. That's a part. It 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 partially um, defines. It gets to the place that it defines who we are, and we get lost in it. And so he says, uh, delusion. He says that we overcome delusion or not understanding things or confusion simply by looking for the dependent nature of things. And that's not so much like like uh, like what happened uh, or even why something happened, but it's how is this occurring? You know, how how is this occurring? By by you know, by what means is this view arising? You know, and it's a, it's a it's like splitting halves, but it's so important in coming to the conclusion because if we understand why something happened, that doesn't necessarily stop it from happening again. Like every time I see you, I don't know, it's just something about you I don't like. You know, I can't put my finger on it. I just know that when I see you, uh, to hear your voice like sets me off. You know, I I know you didn't do anything to me. It's just it's just like this. Okay, so every time I see you, I know this already. I know this the next time I see you. I'm going to feel the same way, you know. But when I understand how this is arising, then I can break, can I, I can break that cycle, you know. Is it what I am seeing with the eye? Is it something I'm hearing with the ear? You know, where is my point of contact with the aversion with you? And when I find that point of contact, it has nothing to do with you. I don't have to deal with you. I don't have to hang around you more to get to know you, to like you. Everything about that situation has to do with me and me making an adjustment in concerning the information that's flowing up, you know, and flowing up in me. And if I get the, like, you give me the creep, fine. You know, I just don't have to be around you. You know, I can, I can set my boundary. With you. If it's like she looks like your mother and your mother used to beat you every day, then I understand that. You know, that, that uh, I'm projecting something just because of a similarity in, uh, in appearance. You know? And I give myself something then that I can, I can work on. You know, and so we work at trying to, to give up things. But the Buddha said, you know, the easiest thing is to give up yourself. <laughs> That, you know, then you don't have to give up one thing. You know, I'm trying to give up my this, give up that, just stop doing this, stop doing that. Just give up your clinging and attachment to yourself and all the rest of that goes with that self that you gave. Yeah. And so, so we chew on that. What does that really mean, you know, the, uh, the giving up of the self? I'm going to talk about it a little bit from Sutta number eight, I think it is. Um, and so... Um, it's just another way is by vows, establishing a vow, you know, establishing a, a guideline for yourself. If I say, I vow to avoid uh, killing living beings, well, in the beginning, that might just mean I won't kill humans, <coughs> you know, but I still go hunting. Uh, or it might mean that I give up killing humans and hunting because I can kind of understand an animal because I have a dog and a cat, but I still go fishing. And yeah, you know, I, um, when 
I became a, a Buddhist. I, I, I used to love fishing. I'm really good, good fisherman. I mean, like, a, well, I was really good. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is that I know, like, I felt like to uh, become a Buddhist, I'd given up everything except fishing. And so I said to Bhante uh, um, Panya Deepa, I said, Panya Deepa, I'm having a hard time with the fishing. And so he said, in, in what way? I said, because I, I just, I like the fishing. He said, well, instead of thinking about the fishing, think about the fish. You know? <laughs> and you know, so the next time I went fishing, I did. You know, and when I caught the fish, and, and, and we catch a lot, because we hired a captain who had the, the thingy that lets you know when you ride over a school and then you just drop, you know, and you come home with 200 fish, you give them to feed the whole neighborhood, what a good girl I am, you know. And uh, and so I, I took a fish uh, off the hook, and then you kind of like catching them so fast, you're just throwing them, on, like, like just to drop the hook. And I looked at the fish, and he was laying there, and he was flopping, you know, and gasping, for, I was going to say for air, but I guess for water, you know. And then there was like this little bubble coming out because he wasn't getting water, which he needed. He was getting air. And I had a flashback to a time that I almost drowned. And I jumped off the, uh, I didn't, I got on the diving board and I looked in the water, it was too far down. So I got off and I went around to the other side and I dived in head first and I hit my head. And the lifeguard didn't see me uh, right away. And so I was down there trying to make my way to the top, but I was disoriented. So I was constantly taking myself, you know, down to, to the bottom. I couldn't figure out how to turn around. And in my panic, if I just relaxed, I would have come up to the top. But I'm struggling, struggling. And then I reached a space that I could not struggle anymore. And then I relaxed. And as I relaxed, I looked and I saw me down there at the bottom of the pool. Uh, this mind stream, this consciousness, and there was that separation of mentality and materiality. And then, the next thing I knew, there was this gasping and this painful feeling, and I was back in my body and the lifeguard had come. And he saved me. So I'm looking and I'm watching this fish. And I'm thinking, you know, I just had that. And suddenly, I got it. And that was the last time I went fishing. So, about a year later, I'm taking my kids to a, uh, to a mall. And they had a fishing machine. It wasn't real fish. It was just like simulated. You know, but you could like throw that rod and, and hook and snatch and have that drag and that pull. And it was just like fishing. You know, and I went, I went home and I said, oh, I fell in this game. <laughs> you know, and, and it's just like, it's a fishing game. That, and he said, you might as well then go and fish. Because in your mind, you're still in that same place. And I got it. And so I gave, I gave. I just gave the whole thing up. And so sometimes we have to really get beyond the action to the intention. And we don't think we have, you know, an intention uh, to harm or, you know, because we haven't looked deep enough. But when he said you might as well fish, because all in your, it's this, this game of catch and, uh, and the subdue, and, and it was true. And, uh, and so that's how I got over it. So we have to look at, at where uh, our stand point is in our conduct. Uh, and um, removing action. Uh, attachments to ways, procrastination, complacency, uh, expectation of return expectation of result. He says, all of these are ulterior motives that lie beneath an action. So we have to like go skin diving. We have to go 
deep to see what our intention is. It's not just the action, it's the intention. So I want to get through one more. Do we have, what time, what time do we? Uh, it can go as late as you like. What time is this in? I keep to the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> What time do we end this set? Um, I have to look up on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can just tell me. 3 p.m.? 3 p.m.? Wait, that's Couldn't the way we, we started at 2 30. Yeah, we pushed this back to 3 30. So Say 3 30. 3 30. Or 4. Does it have the meditation time on? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're good. Because <laughs> I want to get to patience. <laughs> patience. Um, what do you think patience is? A struggle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what else? <laughs> How would you define patience? What kind of gift? I mean, what is it? Uh, it's a, a gift of the self to put yourself in the other person's shoes. So, being able to that. How are you doing with it? <laughs> doing better. Doing good? Yeah. Okay. Then you keep you keep that definition. <laughs> yes. It, oh, Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> it's like a relinquishing of like expectations. Just giving it all in. Okay. Yeah. I think it's um, it's the stop when your mind is rushing and your body just starts to try to do it and then you stop and think, not now. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I think it's allowing. Allowing. Take me a little bit further. Like something's going on. You want something to change. But instead, you just allow it to be as it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Uh, like maybe giving time or space for a further insight of your wisdom. All right, yes. Letting go of time. Okay. Just yes. Stay enjoying a hard time when you see it. Okay. <laughs> yes. How about forbearance? Forbearance. Good. Yes. I think it's the, the lack of impatience. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a hand over here. Just staying. 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 I'm actually going to slightly tweak that. I think it's enduring impatience. Enduring impatience. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So, every, I think almost every except two definitions I have heard were firmly entrenched in the eyeness. You know. Uh, that's why it's so difficult for us in the eyeness. Uh, you know, this patience, it, it's about me, you know, uh, making something better for me. <laughs> you know, making something tolerable, something allowable, something for me. You know. But patience is described as a lack of agitation when harmed by others. Because this is everything that we have to apply patience to has to do with some fixed view that we have, that we now have, even if it's having patience with myself. Because I've been told, you know, that I'm stupid. I'm dumb. I'm not good enough. I'm, you know, I'm the wrong color. I'm the wrong sex. I'm the gender, I guess you should say. I'm the wrong, you know, and something has to be applied, but there is always some outer relationship with that. And so when we think of these transcendences and we think of others as oneself, in other words, what I'm trying to say is everything that we think of whether it's something that we need to improve or something that we need to let go of. What if it wasn't always about me? You know? What's good for me? What do I need to get? What do I need to let go of to be happy? How can this benefit me? 
It's just, it's just, so we can take our Buddhist practice and, and we can just make it really all about us. And that's what has happened a lot in the West because we are a me society. Yeah, it really, that's all we know is how everything fits into our world. You know, we haven't really been in the kind of spaces where we can like, give no thought for oneself because we're all in this together. We just have to do. We are in a me first kind of, of mindset society. And so when we take something as vast as the Dharma, we do the same thing with it. You know, how do I use Buddhism to be happier with my things? How do I use Buddhism to uh, be more focused so I can make more money? How do I use uh, Buddhism to get the man that I love? How do I use, you know, how do I, and it all comes back to us. But if he said, why do we go for to be? A refuge for all beings. So there's an outflow. It's not an inflow. It's an outflow. So if we start thinking in these kinds of, of terms, I need patience with others. You know, the antithesis of patience is anger. So whenever anger is arising, when anger is arising, that's due to a lack of patience. That is the agitation that's coming. Um, so we can understand what patience is whenever there is agitation. Uh, now, uh, it can also be, you know, the Buddha said, when my mind is agitated, like when I'm angry, you know, when I'm angry, my mind is agitated. He said, but when I'm exceedingly happy, mind is also agitated. So it's agitated when it's anywhere off of its still spot. Whether it's going to the negative or going to the positive, the mind is still agitated. And so part of patience uh, and the kind of endurance, the kind of forbearance, the kind of settledness, the kind of stillness that we're seeking has to do with, um, has, is driven by our reaction to things and our reaction to others. And so um, it's a good practice for us to be yoked together, said with spiritual friends and with uh, spiritual teachers who have cultivated patience. Patience allows something to be here or to not be here. There is the lack of agitation. And so sometimes we say when we're harmed by others, it might not be a person, it may be a thing, something others did, you know, uh, that causes us to be impatient. Um, I mean, I have hit my toe before, and I, I got, I'm not so bad I got mad with the rock, but I did get upset with myself, you know? Or are you so clumsy? Oh yeah, that's right, you fell and hit your head. That's, that's why and you have this vertigo in me and you're stable and you're off balance. The minute I understand that, you know, then patience dawns. So patience, to have patience takes a deep investigation uh, beyond the momentary arising of feeling. And that's why it, it's, it's very good to do uh, the mindfulness of feeling meditation. Uh, maybe we'll do that one thing. Uh, feeling, feeling. I mean, feeling is just feeling. I mean, it could be a good feeling, you know, pleasant feeling. It could be an unpleasant feeling. You know, it could be neither pleasant nor unpleasant, but it's just a feeling. Feelings come and feelings go. Sometimes feelings come and they don't even jive with the condition. That's how untrustworthy feelings are. You know? Feelings come and feelings go. So like feeling is arising. You know, we do the best we can do with the feelings rising. But just the recognition that there is feeling. Feeling is arising. And and we can say that it is a pleasant feeling arising, but it's an unpleasant feeling arising. Now, let's say that that unpleasant feeling is arising as a result of something you just did 
or something you just said that I took exception to. Okay, so I have two choices at that moment. If I don't recognize and stop and deal with unpleasant feeling arising, and then I stop and I deal with you. you know? But when I recognize the unpleasant feeling is rising, I stop and deal with that, then that just cuts you right out of the question. I don't even have time to deal with your foolishness. It could be, you know, but whatever it is, I can just leave that right there because right now I have an issue, you know, because unpleasant feeling is arising. What does that feel like? You know, it's feeling like like watch your back, girl. And so what's that feeling like? Well, feeling, actually, it really is a physical feeling. You know, I'm, I'm like, I can't, can't breathe. You know, I'm feeling stabbed in the back. I feel kicked in the gut. One day I wore a dress. My mother bought me, and uh, it was a polka dot dress, and. Um, it was a step up from the plaid. And, I mean, we didn't wear plaid or polka dot in my, you know, my generation. But that was back, a throwback to her generation. She bought me this polka dot dress. And I had to wear it to school. And, and a girl came up and she said, Oh, that's such a pretty dress. <coughs> and those were the words, Oh, that's such a pretty dress. You know? But her words crushed me. Because she was really making fun of the dress. Just those words, oh, that's such a pretty dress. You know? But it wasn't the words. It was the energy that went with the words that let me know that she was, you know, talking about, talking about my dress. It made me feel so bad, you know. And so, so many times something is happening and there's something coming towards us. You know, and if we imbibe that energy, then we've just taken that, and now we've made that our problem. You know, it's nothing worse than somebody doing you wrong, and then you have to go and ask them to forgive you and say, please forgive me. I learned that as a Christian. Somebody do something wrong to me. I get mad with them. I lay them out. I might even curse them out at that time. Then, you know, I, I get convicted, and... And then I'm repenting, and then I go to him and I say, I'm sorry I cursed at you. I'm sorry I, I don't forgive you. Now, it was his fault, but I'm the one going back saying, please forgive me. I mean, you only do that once or twice when you're like, you know, I don't even want to do that. So when he's acting that way, I'm going to leave that with him, okay? I'm not going to take that on. I'm not going to be the one that's going, you only have to do it a couple of times. You try it. And I tell you, and see how you feel. If, when... There is something that arises, and you don't hold, you know, you don't uh, subdue your anger. You just go all out and rail on the person, and you come back when you're in your good Buddha nature, uh, you know, when you're on your good Buddha nature program, and you're thinking, like, you know, that wasn't seemly behavior. You know, I should be able to tolerate a slight. I should be able to tolerate a fault, you know. And then you go back to the person and say, I'm sorry that I acted that way or I said that thing. And and, then, and they're so gracious. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> you know, and so, but you do that a couple of times, you won't want to do it. You just, you'll just give it up. You'll just, you'll just stop. So go out of your comfort zone to make an amend. And that's one way that you can make a definite decision about what you will and what you, what you won't do. I used to go in the store, and if you didn't wait on me, or sometimes like I'd be right at the counter. I'm waiting because there's two people in front of me. They go, the next one goes, and then I'm up at the counter, and then somebody walks over, and they start waiting. Oh, wait a minute. Am, am I invisible? You know, I just stop and ask, am I invisible? Oh, you, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. I said, how could you not see me? I'm standing right here in front of you. You know, uh, but, but now... I might not do that. It just depends. You know, I might look at the interaction and I might let them go ahead. Or she'll say, may, may I help you to this person? I say, and uh, she'll say yes. And I say yes, as soon as you finish waiting on me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'll put my stuff there. She'll say, oh, I'm sorry, you were next. And I'll say, yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> and then this one, he said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. I'm sure you didn't. No, I don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying check yourself in these 
these kinds of ways. You see what I mean? Because we got to come back. We, we, it's our habitual tendency. We have figured it out. We, you know, and we get to the place that we actually fool ourselves. And so then we read these lofty things and we say, I want to be that. I want to, I want to be abiding in, you know, in the formless realms. And I want to do something. But we got all these little ditties right here that we're not addressing. We're not dealing with because we don't see the danger in them. Because they're part of who we are. You know, that's part of our habitual tendency. And we don't, see it. A matter of fact, we can get so good that uh, other people don't even see it. That's how good we've gotten. But to thine own self be true. You know, look deep. See what your real motive is. Um, and here's what the Buddha said. He said, when you encounter the unpleasant, he said, consider it as your good friend. If you had no unpleasantness, if you had no enemy, you would have no occasion to practice. Now, without having the unlovely patience, you know, you can go off to a monastery or a rock or a cave or whatever. <laughs> you can stay there for 10 years all by yourself and you can come out like, Oh, I'm enlightened. You know, as soon as you get down in, in, into the village, you know, and the ox cart's moving too slow in front of you, like the patient's gone completely. I was wondering, because it's easy to do it. You know, it's easy to get all loving and kind on a retreat after the first few days. First few days pretty tough. You know, if you're in close proximity with people that you don't even know, and, and you know, somebody's snoring, and somebody, you know, and you dealing with it. But after you get into a rhythm, you know, it starts to get good. So you're there for a week, you're there for two weeks, and you there for a month, and I got to be close to enlightened. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. As soon as you get home, you know, somebody just go, uh, gets on your last nerve walking in the door, you know, and you wonder, where did, all, where did it go? And that's why it's good to go away, you know. But when we come back, we have, when we get off of our pebble heart, we have to deal with the rubbing out of this self that we try so hard to protect, to make everything work out for, to feel so good about. And that's the bottom line. That's where the juice is in this practice. He said, I call, he said that uh, these kinds of practices in development of these uh, qualities is the basis for acquiring discernment and skillfulness. It's the basis. If we don't do these things, then we're not going to reach our goal. Our meditation is not going to take us too far. I remember there was a really high level meditation master. Um, uh, he's, he's dead now, but uh, they had something called uh, levitation. You know, so I wanted to, like, I wanted to learn to levitate, you know, I can levitate them, I love a yogi. So I wanted, you know, to learn to levitate and in joining with the, their um, meditation group and so forth. And you paid a lot of money to get into the levitation class. And the levitation, I don't think I'm revealing the secret here, um, but the levitation class was <laughs> you know, and they were hopping all over the floor, and they call that levitating. You know, and they were... <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's the truth. And people were paying all of this money, you know, and they were kind of with these distinctions of of a, of a levitating yogi, you know, and all we were flopping around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the basis for acquiring discernment and skillfulness is moral shame. Now, I hope I've changed your view and your idea about shame. It's not the kind of shame that your mama tried to put on you when you didn't do what she wanted you to do or that you were. All these people that you feel had, had just wounded your self-esteem. You know, it's not that at all. But it, is, it is, has its basis in a fundamental 
respect for oneself. Um, and he also said that um, it's called a guardian of the world. A guardian of the world. Our conscience is the guardian of the world. So if we look at the world now, we can see that there is a lack of moral shame that just do anything. There is a, a lack that have lost their basis for acquiring discernment. So if you have any questions, if you would jot those down, we're gonna um, we're going to talk about it in the Q&A. Oh, okay. That's all right. Go ahead. I mean, I find it very difficult in the sense of where I'm trying to make like some work in self-acceptance, and I have like a lot of aversion when I hear anything about shame because it's like that's not where I want to go. I heard that for 30 years that I want to bring more shame in me. Like even though you say it's like self-respect or whatever. For me, I still hear like a voice telling myself I didn't do right, and I try to like not go there anymore. And I, like lately, I was if I catch myself lying, I would say, "Oh, it's okay if you lie," because before I would blame myself and just feel depressed, you know, after that. So I feel like for me, what's helpful now is to do the opposite of this. So you mean like just lie with impunity? You know, I feel. <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to understand. So, if before, if you lie, say, oh, you feel down about yourself because I lied. Yeah. Okay, so now it's like, I lie, whatever, oh, just a lie. You just lie with your well, like, you not, 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 not feel horrible, but like, just say, okay, I lied, maybe I can make it up, but not feel that horrible, like, depressed feeling. You know? mm -hmm. Okay, so what's wrong with that? What have I said to you that, that brought in your sense of being put down? Again, sorry. I'm asking you, what did I bring up today that reinforced your sense of um, aversion? Um, I don't know, like this. Um, I feel like for me, I can't do that before the self acceptance. Like, I feel it's like a next stage for me, but right mm -hmm. now, that still melts into the whole, uh, like, feeling not good enough. Okay. All right. So I understand what you're saying. And this is what I would say to you. If you feel that you can't put something into practice now, it doesn't mean we bring the bar down to where you can reach it. It means you have to keep exercising your muscles until you can reach up and you can grab it. Because the truth is the truth. You know, and to tell you to go in another way would be to not tell you the truth. I'd rather tell you the truth. One day you can reach into it. It's not what, it's not the truth that hurts. It's the issue of, that constantly comes up for you from what somebody else said to you about not being good enough. So one thing I talked about, and I thank you for bringing that up, because one thing I talked about is like, you got to be able to talk about these things, right? You got to be able to say, that's me, I did that. You know, and if you can't, then you push it, you push it away, and you can never come out of your habitual tendencies until you're really ready to turn and to face them and fully accept responsibility for them. I know I don't do everything right. I'm not flagellating myself, and I'm not asking you to flagellate yourself, but I'm also not going to soft soap it. You know, I'm going to call that, I'm going to call that what it is, even when I do it, you know, and... And it doesn't uh, disrupt my self-esteem unless I don't really want to deal with it. If I want to deal with it, it's like, oh, I'm so glad it came to my attention. And I'm so glad I saw it that you didn't have to tell me, you know. And so you can look and you can easily face the things that we do, you know, that we know are not truthful if we know that they're not. You know, sometimes we don't know, you know. And when once we do know, he says, give no place for it. Give no allowance for it. Um, you know, there's a, 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 this new kind of psychology that's out that, you know, that uh, 
just, I feel like it excuses. It makes us impotent because it feels like we can't handle anything, you know? But the thing is, we can. We can handle anything. Even when this remorse and regret, he says that remorse and regret can be used as an energizer for future good works. It depends on whether you're looking forward or whether you're looking backwards. So in all my talking today, I was encouraging you to look forward. I'm encouraging you to look right here, right now, and say, this is good, that's not. He said everything, every thought is of two kinds, either it's wholesome or unwholesome. And it's either beneficial or unbeneficial. He doesn't give us any wiggle room. We just, you know, we just got to look at it, you know, and, and I can call, I can just click through my thoughts. Unwholesome, unwholesome, unwholesome. That's wholesome, unwholesome, that's wholesome. And then after a while, you start to know yourself. You start to see which way the mind, the mind is leaning. So when I'm listening for something, Listen for the good point, not the mind that reinforces the same negative outlook and the same behavior. Listen, be careful how you listen, and listen for that which propels you to go forward, even if I made a mistake. Thank goodness I'm not dead yet. I have a minute to work on this. You know, just kind of encouraging yourself in this way, but then really do it. You know, then we really do have to work on ourselves. We don't just let it come up again the next time and say, well, I'm just not going to beat myself up over that because I do that thing. It's like, Pondua, you need to work on that. You need to, I tell myself that over something every day. Pondua, you need to deal with that. And after a while, Pondua can accept Pondua saying you need to deal with that. I don't want you to say it to me, but I can say it to me. And then after a while, I start dealing with it. I start focusing on it. And I start uprooting that because it's not giving me the results I thought it was going to give me when I did it. That <laughs> Okay, so I think we're going to uh, meditate. <laughs>